Uh, I'm uh, Dennis Feldy, President of Keystone Human Services. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, in thinking about the uh, sign for you know, tonight, I um, wanted to really try to get my arms around the, the issue of what is socialized medicine. And uh, yeah, as you may expect, there really is no um, absolute clarity on what socialized medicine is. And it is a, a vast array uh, uh, of very, very diverse uh, structures around reimbursement, uh, benefits, uh, who's in control, who sets policy. But I thought this was a definition that is useful, that pretty much felt or set in the, uh, you know, the center of the range of definitions. And what's offered here is it's a system of providing universal medical and hospital care at a nominal cost by means of government regulation of health services and subsidies derived from taxation. Uh, and part of thinking about what would be a good example to share this evening as uh, part of the presentation is that uh, Keystone has been involved in uh, work within Eastern Europe, including uh, Russia, for you know, 10 or 12 years now. Uh, some of our work in Russia is in um, uh, uh, the North Caucasus in Beslan, where the attack on school number one occurred in 2004. Uh, and we, we have many of our employees actually work in the Polyclinic Hospital in uh, North Ossetia, uh, in Vladikovkas, next to, uh, to Beslan. Um, we've had fairly extensive experience uh, with the Russian healthcare system and an opportunity to visit in a pretty wide range of uh, psychiatric hospitals, orphanages, and institutions. I thought using uh, Russia as the example that uh, I really you know, agree that the, the, the difference between privatized and socialized is not either or, that it really is a continuum. Uh, but the Soviet system was probably the most highly socialized uh, system of medicine of just about uh, any country in the world. And it actually started uh, to be put in place right after the Russian Revolution in 1917 and developed into a, a very large, centrally controlled, highly integrated, um, a very comprehensive, hierarchical, organized uh, system of care under the direct uh, auspices of the Soviet government. Uh, it actually was quite successful uh, in terms of combating a, a pretty wide range uh, particularly of communicable diseases. And one of the reasons that it was so effective is it had a huge bed capacity, uh, and patients with communicable diseases could actually be isolated for fairly ex you know, extended periods of time. Uh, when the Soviet Union uh, collapsed after perestroika, uh, almost all of the systems within Russia really went into a pretty serious period of, of devolution, including the healthcare system. Uh, but even during that uh, time period, bed capacity and the number of professionals expanded pretty rapidly. Uh, uh, but there were uh, uh, just huge decreases in changes in um, the uh, life expectancy within <coughs> Russia. Now, this is not solely a product of the healthcare system in Russia because there were other things going with the collapse. There was increase in uh, poverty, huge impact of pollution. Uh, uh, alcoholism has a uh, profound impact on life expectancy and healthcare issues within Russia. Life expectancy actually dropped uh, to just a little bit above 54 years for males, which is a, an amazing number for an industrialized country. Uh, it does show that healthcare matters in all of these other areas, and that uh, you know that when healthcare systems do not work, uh, there can be you know, hugely significant consequences. Uh, uh, of that issue. Uh, I know some of the experiences that I had in visiting, uh, I had a, a chance of visiting in a, a cancer hospital in Kursk where the great uh, tank battle occurred in World War II. And uh, one woman was sitting in a room and uh, she did not speak English, but through the translator she motioned to come over like this and she whispered, just no one gets better here. Uh, it's very common that there's almost no pharmaceuticals. Uh, often, uh, alternative treatments are used. Uh, Charlie and I had visited in a children's hospital uh, where very sick children were brought for very extensive therapeutic treatment. But the, the treatment was fundamentally use of magnetism and colored lights uh, and sound. 
Uh, and the children would put through this very rigorous extended therapy for you know, several weeks, um, then would be sent home. And everybody would happen because there was a nice protocol. But most certainly, the clinical protocol had almost nothing to do you know, with the clinical issues that were being presented uh, you know, by the children. In trying to think about the, you know, describing the, what the paradox or what the, uh, the paradigm is between privatized and socialized, uh, I've identified a, a whole series of about 12 you know, criteria that perhaps define that continuum. Um, you know, one is the degree of government funding, the degree of universal coverage that occurs in the system, the degree of government-defined health care policy, the degree of government-defined access, the degree of government-defined clinical protocols, the degree of government access to an electronic medical record, the degree of sanctions on utilization, the degree of government-defined triage policy, the degree of government-defined end-of-life care protocols, and the degree of which health care providers are government employees, the degree to which government imposes medical effectiveness and efficiency protocols, and the degree to which benefits are tied to compliance and personal lifestyle issues. Um, uh, in my role uh, as president of Keystone Human Services, uh, I've been heavily involved in uh, the early design aspects and continuing policy issues around HICSIS, which is electronic medical record for people with intellectual disabilities in Pennsylvania. Uh, Department of Public Welfare has spent probably $300 million developing the system uh, that, that Deloitte is the, the developer. Uh, and 66,000 children and adults with mental retardation and intellectual disabilities are in this system. It's a comprehensive medical record that has all aspects of their interdisciplinary uh, plan. Uh, uh, all of their services on fee-for-service go through the Medicaid claims payment system promised, get queried against uh, HICSIS. Um, uh, if it, it's included, are authorized within the service plan, there's authorizations for payment. Uh, all incidents go into this uh, program, all aspects of the person's life is recorded there. Uh, it's incredibly sophisticated from a claims payment system that uh, now the, Depart the Department of Public Welfare knows exactly what the cost of care is for each individual. And any one day, they can query the system and they know exactly what the historical cost is. Now what did they do the first time that they had access to the data? They ran a statistical test of the 66,000 people and identified who the outliers were, meaning the high cost people, and immediately whacked them down to, uh, if they were above two standard deviations of base cost, you know, their funding got reduced to a median level you know, within the system. So it's an example of what happens you know, when government begins to you know, look at comprehensive medical you know, information from a standpoint of cost containment issues. Uh, uh, the fact that it also has uh, uh, so much information about the individual uh, is that within this system it creates a basis where government has a, uh, a very extensive standing in all aspects of the person's life in terms of where they live, uh, who they live with, what the, uh, the care is, the work situations, the, the kind of housing, uh, health care, use of alcohol, food intake, and diet. And it, it potentially almost creates a window on where we may be going in terms of our national electronic uh, uh, record that was authorized within the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Uh, it's interesting to think if government pays for health care, does it have standing in areas of diet, food, use of alcohol, use of drugs, weight, exercise, income, family violence, genetics, reproduction, use of tobacco, high risk behaviors, marital status, mental health, and end of life decisions. Almost every one of these elements is an inherent part of the HICSA system. In terms of the Department of Public Welfare, looking at these 66,000 people, uh, and the, almost the, the entirety uh, of their, their life experiences. One of the most significant things is the, the funding for the electronic patient record with the intent is that all of us will uh, be included in that system by 2014. And, and the intent is that much like the HICSIS system, that early on, now whether this actually gets implemented or not is anybody's guess, but that it will eventually be able to do uh, clinical effectiveness and efficiency tests against each individual patient to actually monitor physician utilization issues 
in terms of their compliance with federal pro uh, clinical protocols around effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, uh, and you know, I think there's huge implications of uh, being in a national electronic database where potentially very personal, uh, sensitive, and confidential information is, uh, you know, is captured as part of that database. The proposed corollaries <laughs> you know, within this context uh, uh, of huge pressure on, on cost, exploding demand uh, for healthcare within the United States, uh, unsustainable cost. So corollary one is if a government finances health care, that government will have a legitimate interest in almost all aspects of the beneficiary's life. As a government's interest in medical decision making increases, individual autonomy and choice will decrease, and a national medical database will routinely be compromised, and the data collection capacity and electronic medical record increases compliance. Uh, that. Uh, record increases, compliance will emerge as a major determinant of eligibility. It's very intriguing to think what happens when government has the data to begin making some very significant decisions about utilization within healthcare. So thank you all.